to talk to you a little bit about uh, tourism industry here in Hawaii, and more importantly, how destination management companies work within that environment and how we contribute to bring uh, so we'll start off uh, with a little bit of, um, talk a little bit about MCNA, which is the company that Michelle and I represent. MCNA Inc. is actually made up of five different brands. Uh, MCNA uh, itself, the group business, which is the team that I oversee, is uh, the largest portion of those five brands. And that is a pure destination management company which means that we basically deal predominantly with the MICE market. And we're going to talk a little bit more in the next coming slides about what the MICE market is and how that impacts the tourism that comes to the state of Hawaii. So MCNA is the, uh, one of the largest, if not the largest, single uh, independent destination management company in the world. And one of the reasons for that is because Hawaii itself is an extremely rich environment for incentive programs. So where many DMCs operate in major cities around the world, Philadelphia, New York, LA, London, Paris, a lot of those destinations are meetings where the DMC services are predominantly transportation or maybe meeting space. Hawaii is unique in that because of where we're situated and of course the beauty that we have outside, we have a tremendously high percentage of incentive programs. So as a result, the types of programs that come to Hawaii tend to be significantly larger, both in revenue and in number of people, than an average city program. So we'll go into that a little bit more later, but suffice it to say that MCNA, at 170 full-time employees, uh, over $40 million in annual revenue, puts us at number three worldwide in terms of DMCs. Island Partners Hawaii is another DMC brand, actually was a competitor of ours until 2006 when we acquired that brand. They were actually the second largest competitor here in the state of Hawaii. And to give you some perspective, there are about 35 registered destination management companies in the state of Hawaii. Again, a huge number considering the size of the state that we're in, but again, directly related to the fact that there are so much, there's so much incentive business coming to Hawaii. So Island Partners, when we acquired that company, rather than roll that team and those clients into the MCNA brand, we recognized that there was a strength in having that brand. That company, uh, MCNA was founded in 1983. Island Partners was founded in 1985. Um, so 20 plus years of building client relationships. And you'll find this a lot as you go through life when companies that you work for, there's acquisitions that go on all the time. Sometimes it's better to just acquire the people, the clients, the products, and fold it into your existing organizations. More times than not, though, you'll find that there's an established brand. There's a reason why you bought that, that brand or that company. And it means that they have their own established client base. They have their own great products, and you want to keep that going. So that's what we did here with Island Partners. So we right now manage two what's called full-service destination management brands in MCNA and IPH. Diamond Head Vacations is our leisure brand. It's something we're not going to talk a whole lot today about, it, but that's the largest piece of, of tourism that's coming to Hawaii. Believe it or not, you'll see on, on slides coming up, the impact of the mice business on tourism here in Hawaii is about 6%. That's an unbelievably small number. 94% is leisure travel. Diamond Head Vacations basically deals with leisure travelers. American Airlines, Expedia, Travelocity. When you book a vacation to Hawaii through those, uh, any one of those uh, companies, MCNA handles all those people when they arrive at the airport. We do the meet and greet services. We do the activities for those companies. We also handle all the cruise lines out of that Diamond Head Vacations. Norwegian Cruise Line, which as you know operates here 52 weeks a year. We do all their embarkation, debarkation, and we do all their activities. So there's a huge team, over 100 people, that just handles the cruise side of the business. Lux Travel is a specialty brand. It's really for very high-end individual travel. This is a brand that we established uh, about six years ago to handle the hedge fund manager who wanted to bring six tops clients and spend a million dollars in Hawaii. Very, very, very different than incentive travel, really high-end. Private yachts, private homes, 
uh, five-star hotels, just every experience has to be off the charts and something that you can't go out and do on your own. So we have a team of about five people that just handles that Lux Travel business, and they do about 20 to 25 programs a year compared to the 300 that MCNA is doing, the 85 that IPH is doing, but the revenue and the importance of the people that we're serving in that business means that it has to be a standalone, you have to be treated differently, the types of attention we give them is very different. And then Upon a Star is kind of an unknown brand. Uh, we use that, it's purely an event brand. Because we're again a destination management company in an incentive location, events play a huge part in what we offer. Unlike, again, the city location where you're doing transportation and, and some activities, maybe some city tours, we do a lot of uh, awards programs, final nights, welcome receptions, sharing that aloha spirit, the culture of Hawaii. It ends up being a huge amount of event revenue as well. Upon a Star was established basically to support the hotels. So the clients who came in who didn't want to work with a destination management company can work with Upon a Star and basically we support all their events. So that was a lot of uh, information. We'll go through a lot more detail on different things uh, now. But what, like as I said from the beginning, we're going to concentrate really on the destination management company portion of it and show you how that works into the in, uh, incentive business here in Hawaii. But before we go there, I think it's important to talk about what is the MICE market? I mentioned that before. And how does that impact what we're doing here? MICE basically stands for meetings, incentives, conventions, and expositions. A lot of you that are attending the uh, travel industry school up here will get into one of these fields when you graduate. Whether you're working for a hotel or a destination management company or a transportation company or a production company, this is going to end up being a huge focus for you. Believe it or not, the amount of uh, energy that's put into sales on the leisure side of it is actually quite small because a lot of it's actually marketing. And if you guys haven't learned already, there's a huge difference between sales and marketing. Uh, and leisure really is a marketing uh, result where you build leisure travel, whereas sales is more for the mice market. So we're going to spend some time, and we're going to talk about, I mentioned before, the mice market itself only accounts for about 6% of the Hawaii tourism, the visitor arrivals that are coming in here. But in terms of spend from the HTA, the Hawaii Tourism Authority, it's actually 10% of the budget and actually about 70% of the salespeople for the HDA are focusing on the mice business and not the leisure business. The business predominantly books about 12 to 18 months in advance. And what it basically does is it tries to give you a base for that tourism. So where the average leisure traveler is not making their decision until probably six months, some of them are really proactive in a year out you're, you're planning your vacation. But you may be deciding upon a, a vacation destination, but you're not really booking it until about four to six months out. So the mice business is much longer term than that, although it has shortened down over the last couple of years. In the old days, 10 years ago, really old days, we used to operate about two years out to 18 months. If you were trying to book a program, a uh, corporate piece of business within 18 months, you were usually out of luck because you couldn't get space. Everything kind of changed after the financial crisis in 2008, and everything became much shorter bookings. So we're now working really within kind of a one year to 18 month period where we're booking that business. So what does it does? It allows you to get a base business at your hotel or at your destination management company, and it allows you to start forecasting what type of revenues you can expect 18 months down the road because you know what that base is. And it fluctuates pretty wildly. The other thing that, that comes into it is also this, what I'm going to call the AIG effect that Hawaii has to deal with, but it, some people call it the boondoggle effect. For those of you who remember back in 2008 and 2009, there was a lot of public talk about AIG. And AIG uh, happened to be caught in the crosshairs of both President Obama and other legislatures who used that as an example of when the financial crisis happened with the big banks and everyone was accusing the big banks of spending way too much money. This was highlighted and really affected Hawaii and the tourism industry. AIG in particular had a large incentive program going on in I think Mexico or Costa Rica. Um, and it hit the national news where this is a perfect example of banks and financial companies that are taking advantage of a system using your taxpayer dollars and sending people on these crazy vacations. 
It was later retracted in the small print, but the ramifications that it had on places like Hawaii that depend very much on that corporate travel and tourism were long lasting. Hawaii took a hit for a couple of years, and I'll show you some statistics on that, through the end of 2008, 2009, and even into 2010, because corporations were afraid of going out. They didn't want to be in the news. All of a sudden, the corporation that wanted its name splashed all over the place when they arrived. Welcome to Hawaii AIG. Welcome to Hawaii IBM. All of a sudden, they just wanted Welcome to Hawaii President's Club with their logo. They didn't want to be in the news, and they didn't want to be out there. Luckily, that misconception was quickly, not quickly enough, but corrected by, say, the end of 2010. And the reason being is that incentive travel has been proven time and time again to benefit not only the corporations, the employees, which ultimately affects in a positive way the, the economy in general. From as far back as 20 years ago, uh, Harvard had a very famous study that was done that showed the impact on incentive travel. And that's really kind of 25 years ago is when companies, major Fortune 500 companies and Fortune 1000 companies started uh, operating incentive travel. They realized that people wanted more than just their salaries, more than just the benefits they were getting, whether they were medical or otherwise. They realized that salespeople in particular operated at a much higher efficiency rate when they had something that they were working towards. And they identified early on that travel was one of those kind of golden rings, those carrots that people really wanted to achieve towards. And the more studies they did, the more they kind of isolated down what type of travel. And believe it or not, 25 years ago, they identified Hawaii, number one worldwide destination, that when you ch uh, offered Hawaii as your incentive travel, you spiked on average 3% higher sales than any other destination more than London, more than Rome, more than anything else. That has remained true for Hawaii through the last 25 years. And it, again, it leads to that kind of why we're in such a unique situation out here in Hawaii. We're very fortunate. No matter what happens in the world, Hawaii seems to always do well in incentive travel. We're perceived as a very safe location. We're an American location. You don't need a passport. You don't need to change money. Um, things that happen out there that affect uh, corporate travel seem to have a less impact here in Hawaii because of where we are. So, as you can see, we were talking about business travel arrivals. If you look at the top chart, you can see that from 2010 um, through 2015, we had a pretty steady increase in overall visitor arrivals. That's that top, top bar going left to right. At the same time, the uh, mice market arrivals were also rising at a pretty good rate. And down at the bottom, you can see the net percentage. 2010, again, we had that struggle where there was almost no incentive travel. A lot of groups canceled off in 2009. Very few came in 2010. And you can see that's the only dip really in the last 15 years where we haven't had an increase in incentive travel here in Hawaii. And then you see kind of that huge spike in 2011. And that's what we call kind of the uh, financial crisis impact. Hawaii, uh, a lot of groups that come to Hawaii are on an every other year or every third year cycle. And it was pretty evenly spread out. So up until about 2008, our business was fairly flat. We had little ups and downs. Even years were always a little bit lower than odd years. What happened with 2009, uh, companies canceled their programs. 2010, everybody was so afraid of doing corporate incentive travel. In 2011, all of a sudden, kind of was no longer a hot news topic, and all of a sudden, everybody had this pent-up demand to come to Hawaii. So as you can see from the numbers and from our business, we spiked huge in 2011, and we had a ton of corporate business come to the islands. Ever since then, because of the every other year demand, we've had much higher dips and peaks with that odd year, even year phenomenon. But as you can see overall, for the most part, the mice business has kept pace with the increases and in certain years like 2014 uh, and 2015 really exceeded the average arrivals. So that's good news for Hawaii in general and for tourism in Hawaii that you can see over the last five to six years that we continue to grow not only non-group arrival business but certainly group arrival business as well. So, what is kind of Hawaii's role uh, in meeting the needs of the industry? 
Um, so as I said before, building that base is really important to overall tourism. It really sets the goals for how you set your pricing going forward. Unlike a lot of products that are out there, like technology products, that have pretty much a set price, the hotel prices in particular fluctuate on an hourly basis at hotels. And it's all based on what your occupancy is and what your demand is. Knowing what your base is really helps you to set what that pricing is going to be far enough out that you can make changes to it. The interesting thing that's going to affect everybody in this room, should you choose, choose to go into this industry, is that more and more hotel companies are owned by investment companies now. Those investment companies are really concerned with the bottom line, first and foremost, more than anything. And what we've seen here in Hawaii, especially the bigger brands, uh, the Hiltons, the Sheridans that are owned by these investment companies, is that there's a reluctance for them to commit to building that base because when you look at those leisure numbers that continue to go up and up and up, higher demand means what? Higher prices, right? They can get a higher rate for their rooms. So the, from an investor's point of view, the guy who's sitting in the office in California or New York, who's responsible for the financial results of the hotel here in Hawaii, he's not looking at what's going on here. He's looking at on paper, how much money, how can we maximize the revenue that's coming out of there? And it's our responsibility for people in the tourism industry and the people that are the boots on the ground here, we have to continue to make that argument that this is not a pure investment decision. This is about building that base, because the second you lose sight of that, if God forbid that tourism, uh, leisure tourism all of a sudden drops, now all of a sudden you've got a half empty hotel because you weren't willing to come in at a reasonable rate two years ago to book that, you know, 20,000 room group that came to Oahu. So that's the challenge of the industry, is not just to convince clients to bring their incentive programs, to bring their leisure travel here to Hawaii, but to convince the hotels and the activity vendors and everybody else here, destination management companies, to price their product reasonably so that Hawaii continues to be an attractive place to want to do business. Long term, that long term price hesitation is a, is a right now probably the single biggest problem that affects the tourism industry here in Hawaii. Not willing to commit to a rate that's reasonable for a corporate group to come into the Hawaii, not wanting to commit 18 months out, saying we don't really have availability. A group that's five, 600 people, or in the case of a citywide, that could be 10, 15, <coughs> 20,000 people. Last year we had Lions Club, 20,000 people in Honolulu. When you tell them we can't commit to you right now, they're going to go find another location. So again, a huge opportunity and a huge challenge for us within this industry to keep moving forward, to continue to convince state legislators, investment companies, that building that corporate base, even though it's only 6%, again, of the total arrivals, that it's an important base and an absolutely necessary base for Hawaii to build in order to set the pricing for the rest of the leisure. And then kind of the last thing is making peace with the industry and the culture and the whole sense of Ho'okipa. And I think you guys are familiar with Ho'okipa up here. Actually, this school, um, and you know, I'm totally drawing a blank, David, but the, there was a gentleman who was very involved with BIU who, BYU who kind of invented that whole concept of tourism, Ho'okipa, the culture of hospitality and sharing that aloha with everybody that you see. And finding the balance between what's best for business, what's best for the aina and the land, what's best for the culture, and what's best for the uh, individual businesses that were supplying those things. And I think Hawaii's done a great job with that. Let's face it, there's dozens if not hundreds of beautiful islands around the world, right? Groups could go to those, leisure travelers could go to those. What sets Hawaii apart from all of those islands is the sense of aloha and the culture that Hawaii has. It's what keeps bringing people back. We have clients that come to Hawaii every other year. They'll go to Tahiti once, They'll go to Fiji once, they'll go to Rome once, they'll go to London once, but you know what, they'll go to Maui next year, two years after that they'll go to the Big Island, and so on. So Hawaii has this, with the, the culture, has this tremendous draw at bringing people back here time and time again. Why choose Hawaii? So this is actually from the HVCB website. I wanted you guys to see where the state's official stance so the HVCB is the Hawaii Visitors and Convention Bureau. 
They are a private organization, one of about five that is tasked by the HGA, which is the state brand, to basically market and sell Hawaii. HVCD markets the North America. That's the organization that, uh, that markets North America. And from their website, you can see these are the main reasons that they're putting out to corporations of why you should choose Hawaii. It's a productive atmosphere. The accommodations, we have 38,000 uh, rooms in, in uh, Waikiki alone. The international accessibility. You know, look at where we're located. We have more uh, Asia Pacific groups operating here in Hawaii because we have all the facilities to be able to do it and we're smack dab in the middle of the Pacific. Our ex-governor, uh, Abercrombie, made a great comment at a, uh, a dinner one night that I was at. And he said, you know, a lot of people look at a map and you see Hawaii separated by ocean from the rest of the world. And he said, I prefer to look at it the way that the ancient Polynesians did, is that that ocean is the road that connects us to the rest of the world. And that's really true. And where we're situated, if you were to shift the entire map and put Hawaii at the center, the world map looks much more normal and balanced with Hawaii at the center in the Pacific Ocean and everybody coming here. We're in a perfect geographic location to have a lot of uh, international meetings. Experiential offerings, obviously all the activities, the rainbows, the waterfalls, all the different things that you can do here. Natural wonders, again, you're not going to find many places that are as beautiful as Hawaii. The Hawaii Convention Center, obviously, is a big opportunity to bring in larger groups. Off-program activities, again, those activities that you can do when you're not attending meetings here, is a huge part of what brings people to Hawaii. Enrichment opportunities, expert assistance, and of course, sun and surf. So this is not, you know, these are the main reasons that we're using to sell, the main sales uh, incentives that were, David, I'll send you a copy of this. You don't have to take pictures. <laughs> um, but these are the main reasons that the state is choosing to focus on to convince people to come to Hawaii. So now we're going to get more into kind of the DMC thing, and I hope this is interesting for you. Who are the clients that we're t we talk about when we're talking about MICE business? Um, Third-party incentive companies. This is an interesting one. These are large companies that exist all over the world that their sole purpose is to help large corporations incentivize their employees better. Travel incentive, believe it or not, is actually a really small part of the overall picture, but it's the part that we're focused on and what we're going to talk about today. It's actually about 27% of the overall incentive. Large companies that you, some of you will come to know in the future, Merit, ITA, Carlson Wagon Lid, uh, BI, they're all companies that are out there that have access to dozens and dozens of Fortune 500 companies. They're in their offices, they have desks in their offices, and they basically help them with all of their marketing and all of their support throughout the year, some of which ends up at, as incentive travel. But think about every time there's a promotion in a McDonald's or every time there's a, you know, win a free trip to here, or call in for this and you get that. Or even within a, a large corporation like a Google or something, maybe only the top 1% ever earn that incentive trip. But you know what, there's another 10 to 15% that earn points where they can buy from a catalog. Maybe it's a Bose system, maybe it's a pair of sunglasses, maybe it's a pencil sharpener, who knows. But all that stuff that goes into that is all part of that large uh, opportunity in that large industry out there that is the travel incentive, or the, sorry, the third party incentive companies. They are actually MCNAs, about 70% of our uh, groups come from third party incentives. The rest of it comes from these other two, which are corporate direct and associations. IPH, on the other hand, going back to why we wanted to keep that as a separate brand, they have about 85% of theirs comes from corporate direct. So. John Hancock doesn't go through a company called Merits, they go directly to IPH or they do go directly to MCNA. Associations are the last ones they hardly ever use, uh, incentive companies, and they're mostly looking at the, the way that they book business is completely different. They look much more 5, 10, some are even 15, 20 years down the road is where they're booking their business. It's fairly easy to find a hotel in the state of Hawaii that can hold 100 to 200 to even 500 people a year out. It's almost impossible to find a hotel that can hold, or a number of hotels that can handle 20,000 people a year out. 
So when you look at large citywide associations, you're typically going to find that they're booking that a lot further out. Okay. So that was kind of, uh, took up half my time just talking about kind of the background in the industry. So let's really get into what is kind of destination management company. My hope here is that some of you will walk away with a better understanding of how destination management plays into the overall tourism and that hope, hopefully some of you will be excited by what you see here and will look to the destination management companies as a uh, future for you. Okay, so going, oh, sorry. Okay, so, okay. So there we go, starting with our, our primary services. Um, hotel sourcing, and I'm gonna spend uh, just really quick time talking about each of these. Hotel sourcing really is involved with, um, when a person is trying to put together a, and keep in mind that most of these corporations have very small meeting planning departments. A lot of times it's an executive admin assistant who's told by her boss, the, the VP of sales or the VP of marketing, we're gonna do an incentive for 80 people, find me some locations. Think about how daunting that is. How many countries there are in the world, how many resorts there are, how many hotels there are in each one of those countries. So sourcing is a huge, huge, huge project. There's tons of software out there that companies like us have access to that makes that much faster. With a couple of inputs, you can send out to as many as you want, 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 different hotels in 200 different countries and say, check the availability, give me some pricing, and let me know what it's gonna cost to have a five night program for 100 rooms. So that's one of the main areas that DMCs uh, and incentive companies can help those corporate clients, is finding hotels that have availability, have the price that meets what the clients are looking for, and the location that they want. Once they've kind of chosen their destination, um, airport services is one of the biggest things, especially here in Hawaii. We have this great culture of handing out lay. And so the lay greeting in Hawaii is such a special thing. People come here, and especially first timers to Hawaii, getting that lay at the airport is really welcoming you into the islands. So that experience is very important here. We're also very unique here in Hawaii in that because we've been doing this for so long and because the uh, Hawaiian lay greeting is such an important part of the culture, we're probably the only city in the US and probably one of the few cities in the world where our greeters can actually lay greet at the gate. Every other place you have to go down a baggage claim because of TSA and different security concerns. But here in Hawaii, we actually, so the second they get off that, the, uh, the plane, they're met right there with the staff, they're given their leg rating, they're escorted down to the baggage plane. It's a whole different level of experience than what they're used to. And then of course that kind of leads into transportation. And transportation, the biggest part of it is airport transportation. So we're booking vehicles back and forth to the airport. But in addition, throughout the program, there's transportation to dinners, there's transportation to activities. Transportation is a huge part, typically in the neighborhood of about 40% of the total uh, revenue of the program comes from transportation especially on an island like Hawaii. You want to get people out to Pearl Harbor, you want to get people up to the North Shore. There's lots and lots of transportation companies that we work with to achieve that. And then the last thing actually says hospitality services. So that's kind of the desk people, uh, concierge services once your attendees are here. Um, they basically, we call them travel directors, but they're the on-site staff. We assign them to a program Basically, from the day before, when the attendees start showing up, they start getting ready, they start getting the hospitality desk ready, they start reconfirming the activities and the transportation, and they're there, again, to share that spirit of aloha when the attendees arrive. Again, they've won this trip, they've earned this. The incentive only works, they're only gonna produce higher revenues for their company, which in turn, again, I wanna keep stressing this, higher revenues for companies in most companies means that that money goes back into the economy, the local economies in, the, in those uh, cities and towns. So it benefits them and their families. But they, they're gonna come here, you need to give them a great experience or else it's not an incentive and it defeats the whole purpose of doing it. So we have this really highly personalized uh, hospitality services. 
I've always said this is, at the end of the day, it's a service industry. I think people in this room who are thinking about going into hospitality and tourism, if you love service and you get joy from servicing other people, there is no way you will not be successful in, in doing this. If you don't deep down love being with people and love helping people, then it's gonna be a rockier road ahead. But everyone who succeeds is someone who truly loves the concept of servicing. Staffing, again, we have all kinds of staffing. A lot of times people have uh, business meetings. Uh, they have food and beverage contracts with the hotel. They have lots of different things that they need staff for. Many companies will bring staff from the mainland, but a lot of others will actually hire our staff to basically support those functions. So basically, we could do, you could be involved with food and beverage. Many of you will take different paths and maybe not end up where you, where you thought you'd start or where you thought you'd be. And I'll go through that with my own life a little bit at the end. I'll, I'll make it really quick. But I'll show you how different things can happen. But you, at the end of the day, providing staffing is a big part of what you're going to end up doing. Activity support, pretty uh, self-explanatory, especially in a place like Hawaii, all the snorkel trips, horseback riding, zip lining, all those things. We provide all that support for incentive trips as well. Event services, as I said earlier, a huge part of it. Here in Hawaii, we do lots of ho'olaleas, uh, beach events, um, luau events, award ceremonies, and all those different things. And people need everything from linens and centerpieces, and that's it, to full-scale production, where we bring in Sting or Bon Jovi or any major entertainment that's out there we've brought into this island. There's actually very few entertainers that we haven't contracted at some point or another to come here. Elton John was just here a year ago for a corporate group of ours. So there's companies that bring those entertainers in here and we facilitate all that. And that goes right along with the uh, te technical production side of it as well. We do some very large scale production services. Entertainment, as I mentioned, and then meeting collateral if you're doing an association. So there's a lot of that. So hopefully you've seen throughout this, when we talk about meeting collateral, we have graphic artists that work for us that don't have a hotel and restaurant degree. I have PR people that work for us that don't have a hotel and restaurant degree. You could have a hotel and restaurant degree and love PR or be a graphical artist on the side. There's lots of different opportunities for you to do and lots of ways with the destination management company for you to get involved. Uh, really quickly, the process is really split into two things, a sales process and an operations process. The sales process really starts with the, the sales team itself. Obviously, you're going out to corporate clients. You're meeting with them at trade shows. Uh, I don't know if you guys have had an opportunity yet, but there's a lot of major trade shows like IMEX in Vegas that have a ton of college students that they host there every day to go there and to start seeing what the industry is all about. We spend a lot of time at those trade shows meeting and talking with our clients, finding out what their needs are, what they're looking for in their programs, and how we can help fulfill that. Program development is really early stages of the sales process. They help to design the program. So really clients come to us and they say, we're gonna do a five night program in Hawaii, tell us what we should do. We go back and say, you should do two days of activities and here's the 10 activities you could choose. You should have a welcome reception and here's three choices to choose from and here's three linen choices for each one of those three choices. We end up with a 110 page document that we basically send back, back to them and eventually it gets whittled down to the program that they're gonna operate here in Hawaii. The second half of the process is the operations process where now the program, we've done with the planning and the program's here. So we have an operations team that basically now is calling all those vendors and saying, okay, here's the service orders, we're gonna confirm, we're gonna uh, start processing payment for all these things, you know, cut the block down from 20 to 10 or increase the block from 20 to 30 and start firming up all those activities. The travel directors I mentioned before are the ones who show up on site and who basically are there to handhold the clients through the whole process. Airport staff are the ones that are doing the meet and greet and also all the transportation. And then of course accounting. You may love numbers, you may love an accounting. I have an accounting degree, I never really loved accounting, but I am good at math and it's helped a lot uh, over the years and accounting is a crucial part of it. Knowing not only how to bill, anybody can do that, you can train somebody to be a bookkeeper, Understanding when you're having a conversation with a client, understanding where your profit margin is, how much room you have to give, how much you need to give by reading the client's eyes so that you can get that business, how much wiggle room you have, 
what's incremental revenue? When does incremental revenue come into play? When is it not incremental revenue because you don't have enough on the books and you have to meet your, your overhead costs? All those types of things, you really have to have an understanding. Any business background, the school that I went to in New Hampshire, uh, back in those days there were only a couple of them where the hotel school was part of the business school. Most of them were part of the liberal arts school. Nowadays you see a lot more that are part of the business program and even those that aren't really stress having a, a really strong business background. It's really important when you get into a business like this. I'm moving a little bit faster because I'm running out of time. Uh, the event side of it, um, again, uh, I'm just going to go back real quick and just show you uh, real fast. This, uh, the events that we do, and I wish, uh, for those of you who want to come up and, and kind of look through the pictures and everything, we're going to be here for a little bit afterwards and I'm happy to show that to you. I will also, you can get in touch with me uh, through David or Steve. We have a tremendous website. I encourage you to go look at it. It has a lot of great photos of the events we do. One of the reasons that a lot of people come to us and want to work for us or want to do interns, internships with us is because they want the glamour side of it. And that's okay. There's a lot of hard work and there's a different side of it, the operations, the program development, but there is a great glamour side. We have an events department that's about 45 people and all they do every single day is put on amazing events throughout the islands. And their job is literally traveling, flying back and forth, chalking up 150,000 Hawaiian miles a year, going back and forth and putting on amazing events. It's a great life. So if that's something that's interesting to you, this could definitely be a possibility. So my last three minutes, because uh, I do want to have some time for question and answers. I, I want to give you a little bit of uh, background and Michelle about how we kind of got into the business. I have a hotel and restaurant degree. I started off in hotels, as many of you will. Uh, I started with a chain called Stouffer's, which doesn't exist anymore. Uh, they were owned by Nestle. They did have a hotel here in the islands. Um, they were, at the time, kind of a boutique, an interesting chain that, in this day and age, never would have survived, and clearly they didn't. Uh, I spent about two years in the uh, hotel business and decided that that really wasn't for me. Uh, so I got into the restaurant business, uh, moved back to New York, and spent the next 11 years opening restaurants in New York City and northern New Jersey. Uh, I was there, uh, in like I said, for about 11 years and then uh, decided that I had had enough of that and I was going to go to law school to waste two years of my life and figure out what I wanted to do with my life. In the meantime, a buddy of mine called me and said, hey, there's this GlaxoSmithKline pharmaceutical program operating out at Pebble Beach. I love golf. He's like, the guy who was supposed to do food and beverage just broke his leg and he can't go out there. Can you do it? And I said, what am I supposed to do? I don't know what I'm supposed to do out there. He's like, you'll be fine. Just go out there. So I go out, spend two weeks out there working for a woman named Mary Charles, who is the MC in MCNA. She was the founder of MCNA. She sold the company in 2006. And she convinced me that there's too many damn lawyers in the world and that I should come to Hawaii and be a salesperson for a destination management company. What did I know? So, I put my, uh, my uh, degree on hold uh, to go get my law degree. I took a two-year uh, deferment um, and basically came to Hawaii and committed to doing a year to two years out here. That was 16 years ago. Uh, and we've been living out here and loving it ever since. Uh, so I have been my entire career in Hawaii has been with, D, uh, with MCNA and with DMCs. I really love it. Uh, I have to tell you that it's a, the tourism industry is a, an interesting road and at times it can feel like it's a slow road to get to success. But I feel like if you follow your passion and you follow what you love doing, you're going to be good at it and eventually the success will come. And for some of you that will be financial, for others it will be happiness, family, religious, spiritual, whatever it is. Be happy. Be content in what you do. Look for the good in what you do. I complain to my wife every time that I have to go out to a dinner with clients. Oh, another night that I have to go out. I sit down at that dinner and I have to tell you 99.9% .9 of the time, I thoroughly enjoy myself. I love being around people. I love talking about this beautiful state that we live in. It makes my job easy. I'll let Michelle uh, talk a little bit about how she got into it. So quick introduction. So Michelle is our senior sales admin and she's going to tell you super quickly about how uh, she got into the industry. And then she's going to talk to you a little bit about our internship program. You have two minutes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I took up too much time.
interested in the tourism and marketing side. So to begin my career, I got a job at Sea Lake Park, which is one of the only theme parks that we have in Hawaii. There I worked in retail and assisted in um, activity check-ins, so getting guests ready for their dolphin swims and whatnot. Um, but I found that even though I liked learning how a theme park operated, I was really interested in how they see the animals and conservation for the marine life. So my next internship took me to the Waikiki Aquarium, which is a nonprofit but also works as a tourism attraction as well. So there I was a community outreach intern where I assisted in events where we helped put on the annual Keikani Mokekai summer concert series and also things like Ocean Literacy Day. And I also assisted in facility rental, which was um, like if people wanted to have their weddings or grad parties on property in the aquarium, we could help them rent out that, for that evening. My third internship was probably my most favorite. I was actually part of the Disney College program. So my last semester in college, I applied, and three months after graduation, I was moving to Disneyland. And I worked in as uh, in food and beverage for the New Orleans Square. So while living there, we also took classes taught by Disney executives. And being a local girl, born and raised in Oahu, it was my first time living on the mainland, so it was really an eye opener to see you know, different in cultures and just being away from home for the first time. And I actually loved it so much that I stayed on with the Disney company after my internship ended. But eventually, you know, you start to miss home, you start to miss the beach and whatnot. So one day I got a call from one of my good friends who happened to also be my college classmate and my roommate at the Disney College program saying that she had a job opening at MCNA. So I ended up applying, moving back home, and three years later, here I am, <laughs> the senior sales and marketing coordinator at MCNA. So like Mike said, I helped the sales team um, with all their site inspections, also initial proposal design, and our internship program, which is basically a 12-week program, but it's very customizable to anything. If people are still in school, things like that, we can always make things flexible, and also it kind of gives you a process of how our actual programs work. You start off in the sales department, you work your way through the program development, operations, and eventually you get to do the glamorous part, which the events. You actually get out in the field and see how things are put on firsthand and how it becomes into reality. And then you do also spend time in the airport services and then also graphics and like, there's so many opportunities within MCNA, any interest you have, you can also take them into account. Yeah, it's really important for you guys to understand that, and I hope you, you take that away uh, today. There, we tried to show you that there's a lot of different directions you can go with in the tourism industry. And Working with a DMC, working for a DMC, allows you to see a lot of different avenues to get there. And you know, at the end of the day, we're looking for service-oriented, friendly, outgoing, creative thinkers, organized people. But we designed our internship program specifically so that you touch every part of what we do. We want you guys to come down there, if you choose to, and leave there having a better understanding of at least the start of the road that you want to go down. Do I love the hotel side of it? Do I not like the hotel side? Do I like doing the DMC side? Do I like, maybe I want to go open up a kayak shop. You know, I think what we can give you is an opportunity to see tourism. You're in a, a microcosm that is extremely unique here in Hawaii. Take advantage of it. You're getting educated in probably one of the best places in the world to learn about tourism. If tourism didn't exist in Hawaii, Hawaii would be a very different place. Um, and I think so take advantage of, of what you see out there right now, and what you're able to access. Uh, so, uh, sorry, we're really pushing time. I do want to uh, kind of cut it short then at that and ask you, are there any questions that anybody has that I can answer now? Again, I'm happy to stay around as long as you guys would like if people have individual questions. I know you need to be done in the next couple of minutes here. Um, so, thank you very much. And I apologize again if I spoke too fast or kind of rushed through that. I, there was a lot I wanted to cover. I felt it was really important that you guys understand really the state of the industry here in Hawaii and in how we fit into it, specifically um, into tourism, but especially on the corporate side of it. So um, thank you very much for coming today. I hope it was uh, worthwhile for you. Uh, and if there are any questions, I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>